Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. It's a girl Fanny Lungu back with another reaction video. So today I'm going to be reacting to Lively Childhood of Prophet Muhammad Part 2. I think I did the I did part one a few months ago and I think I was just caught up. That's why I didn't do the second part and it was requested that we do the second part. So if you're new to this channel, like I said, give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends and of course do not forget to subscribe. And without wasting time, let's get into the video. First and foremost, they wanted the child to be raised in a pure and healthy environment. Also, they wanted to build stamina in the child. Stamina in the child and make them adjusted to a rough life. Now, even though from our standards, life in Mecca was unbelievably tough, right? But for the people of Mecca, they're used to it. And so they want to raise their child in an even more austere environment so that they then become accustomed to the hardships of Mecca. And this shows us that the Quraysh had long-term planning, they had vision. That the child is raised in a difficult environment such that the hardships of Mecca appear like luxury. Another uh, reason that some of the people have mentioned is that l growing up in uh, the desert away from the family will avoid the pampering that other relatives do. So once again, to raise the child in a disciplined environment, right? They would be handed over to a particular family. And the final reason that the scholars of history mentioned for this rather strange custom from our perspective, but from them they were accustomed to it. The final reason that they mention is that the child being raised in the desert amongst certain tribes. Now realize, not every tribe would go into Mecca and, and ask for, for children. These are certain tribes that are known for this, uh, for this fact. These tribes were known for their fluency in Arabic. Now the Arabs viewed the language of the cities as being corrupted. The Arabs viewed the city language as being the, uh, changed. Why? Because what happens to any language, it gets influenced by other cultures. Any language gets word loans from other cultures, right? The point being, where does this occur? Not in the desert, not amongst the villagers, amongst, amongst the city dwellers, right? So the Arabs of the Quraysh, again, they're thinking long term. They don't want the, the traders from Yemen, from, from all over the country to come and corrupt their Qurayshi dialect. So what do they do? They send them to the pure areas the tribes that were known for their fluency of the Arabic to be uncorrupted, to be speaking the original ancient Arabic. And the most famous tribe that was known for this, uh, the, 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 the saving of, let's say, the pure Arabic is the Banu Bakr ibn Sa'd, the Banu, uh, Sa sorry, the Banu Sa'd ibn Bakr, the Banu Sa'd ibn Bakr. And of course, it was this tribe that adopted uh, or that took care of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Banu Sa'd ibn Bakr was the most a uh, famous tribe known for taking care of the children of the Quraysh, known for speaking the proper Arabic. Now you all know the story of Halima, we're just going to summarize it briefly. Uh, Halima bint Sa'diyya, the famous uh, uh, foster mother of the Prophet ﷺ, she narrates the story in the first person. And it is recorded in a number of books of hadith and of seerah. And so inshallah it is an authentic hadith, no doubt about that. That she said that uh, she and her husband were suffering greatly from poverty. And this was of course, now why would they take care of a child? They wanted money, obviously. They are uh, villagers, not even villagers, they are people living in the Bedouin. They are desert dwellers, right? And of course, as you know, desert dwellers, they don't get much income. Life is very tough. So one of the reasons why they would walk into Mecca and adopt children from the rich people of the Quraysh, this was a custom only for the rich and elite. It was not a custom for all of the people of Mecca. Only the noblemen, and as we know, Abdul Muttalib is the chieftain, so his children and grandchildren, they must have this custom. This is a custom for the noblemen and the elite. And of course, by the way, in our times, uh, the rich, they have nannies. The rich, they have governesses, right? This is the custom of our times. In those days, this was the rich, they would send their children to uh, the desert. So Halima narrates that we were suffering greatly from poverty. So she's explaining why would she want to take another baby? Because that baby gets money, the, the parents give money. And so I convinced my husband to go with the uh, yearly, there was a yearly time that the uh, women of uh, Banu, Sa Banu Sa'd ibn Bakr uh, would go to Mecca and would obtain any newly uh, born child who would be willing to be adopted, well, not adopted, but foster fed for two, three years. So there was an annual event. Everybody knew this was the period. For one week, they're going to come and they're going to uh, find out 
who has given birth and they're going to go knocking on their door and the mother of the child will choose which of them seems to be the one that I like the most. Just like we do in our times, you choose the nanny, the governess, so the mothers would choose the best one. So Halima says that uh, she had just had a newborn. Now, of course, you have to have a newborn to take care of another because you're going to breastfeed. So she just had a child and they're suffering from poverty. And by the way, she had an older daughter as well. So when the process was taken in, there were two children of Halima. There was an older daughter, probably around seven, eight years old, we can estimate. Her name was Shayma. Her name was Shayma. And so she is the foster sister of the Prophet Wasallam, And she had a newborn son. I could not find the name of this son in the five or six books that I looked up over the early period of Islam. Allah knows maybe we'll find him in other books, but I could not find him in uh, those original books. Uh, so she had a newborn son and she had an older daughter, Shayma. This newborn son, of course, is what caused her milk to flow. And so she is able to uh, foster care another child. So she goes with her group of uh, newly mothers, because they're all new brothers. You have to be a new mother to take another child on. Uh, and so she goes with the group, probably five, ten women uh, from her clan, and they enter into Mecca and they find out who has given birth. And they hear of the newest batch that has come forth in the last uh, five or six or seven months. One of them, of course, is the child that was called the orphan child. They were told immediately there's an orphan child. His father's already dead. Some of the women didn't even go visit the house of Amina because the only reason you'd adopt a child is because you want money. And when the child is an orphan, then it's known that you're not going to get that much money. After all, I mean, where is he going to get money from? Abdul Muttalib, no doubt he's the chieftain, but he has, you know, 10 sons and, and, and 5 daughters. And of those, so many grandchildren, who's going to give a, a, a large sum? Uh, of money for an orphan. So some women didn't even go to the house of Amina. Others went and when they saw how poor and the poverty, they, they didn't uh, like the, taking uh, a child who was an orphan. Halima as well visited and she tried to move on to find another child because she wanted the money. When the week finished, every one of her friends had acquired one of these newborn children except for Halima. And the only child remaining was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she told her husband that I feel embarrassed. It's, it's like a bit shameful that all of my friends are going back now to uh, the desert and they have a child and I don't have any. It seems like it's, I'm lost. I mean, it's not fair, meaning I want to be like them. So her husband said, why don't you take the orphan child? Perhaps Allah will bless us through him. Notice there's good in his heart. Perhaps Allah will, maybe he's not going to bring that much money, but perhaps Allah will bless us. And this shows the couple were a good hearted couple. They had good manners, they were, they were thinking religiously as well, even though at this time they're pagan, but they realized taking care of an orphan is a noble thing. So her husband said, why don't you adopt, why don't you take care of the foster child that's an orphan? Perhaps Allah will bless us through him. And so they agreed to take care of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All the narrations say that as soon as they took the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the miracles began right then and there, that uh, she only had one old goat that had stopped giving milk for a long time. As soon as the Prophet ﷺ entered into the tent, the goat's udders became full. Uh, she had an old uh, uh, mount that they were riding the both of them. And when they put the Prophet ﷺ along with the family on this ride, on this animal, it became the fastest animal. All of these are mentioned. And of course, this is no problem at all. Allah Azza wa Jal blesses uh, whoever He chooses. And it is expected that these things would have occurred uh, to those who took care of the Prophet ﷺ. Generally speaking, this, this foster care usually lasted two years. The custom was to take care of the child for a year and a half to two years, right? So you don't come back the next season, uh, you come back to visit. You come back to show the child the next season, and the child stays with the mother a month or two, and then given back to the, the foster care. So after two years, when the time has come, uh, and in the middle, Allah knows how many times uh, she came back to show the child, no doubt they must have arranged something, we don't have any details. But it's not as if there's no touch at all, there's no contact at all. Every few months, every whatnot, there must have been some type of returning, and Amina would have met her son, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. During these two years, the blessings that Halima witnessed in her household were so many that she was scared of losing the Prophet And so she invented a million and one excuses in front of Amina. 
that the child is still young and I don't want to set him, send him back to uh, the, the, the city and is going to be problematic and there's diseases and plagues and we'll take care of him. And she kept on persisting, persisting, persisting until Amina felt that there was so much care and love that, uh, that the Prophet is in good hands. And so she agreed to extend this contract for a longer period, even though for sure she could not have given the amount of money that her Halima's other uh, friends would be getting. But it is not money, it was the blessings that came with the taking care of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, it was during the second phase of this foster care that the famous incident of Shaq al-Sadr, of opening up of the heart occurred because there are authentic ahadith about it because the Sahaba saw the line on the chest of the Prophet ﷺ that showed that it had been opened up. So this is clearly something that we believe in. When the Prophet ﷺ was four years old, Anas ibn Malik narrates the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, so there's an authentic hadith, no question about it. That Jibreel came to the Prophet when he was playing with the other children. When, when Jibreel came, the other children ran away, they're scared. The Prophet stood his ground. As a four year old kid, he's displaying bravery. He stood his ground. What do you want from me? And Jibreel came and overpowered him. Sara'ahu. This means that he was struggling. Four year old kid is fighting. An angel, the strongest angel Allah has created, but he's not going to go without a fight. Again, this shows the determination of the Prophet Muhammad So Jibreel forced him on the ground. You can't fight Jibreel. He forced him on the ground and he opened up his chest. Shaqqa sadrahu. It's just two words. Opened up his chest. How, what, all of this Allah knows. Jibreel does not need instruments to do what Allah wants him to do. He opened up his chest and he took his heart out. And he took out a black slither, a black portion from the heart and he threw it away. And he said, minka. This is shaitan's portion that he had in you. And then he washed the heart in a golden cup of zamzam and then he put it back. So he washed the heart and he put it back and he sealed it up. He put his hand like this and the heart sealed up. So when the children, the foster brother and Shayma, who he was playing with, uh, when the children ran away, they ran back and they said, and they're looking in the distance that there's a man throwing him on the floor, putting blood in and this and that. So they come screaming and running that our brother has died, our brother has been killed, a man has abducted him, a man has killed him. And of course, Harima and others, they became so worried, they come running outside and they found the Prophet ﷺ sitting, his face is pale. He's sitting there, you can t sense the fear, the, the terror, but he's not wailing and screaming. And when they uh, saw him, they saw those lines on his chest. And Anas ibn Malik says, I could see the traces of that line on his chest. Anas is narrating this hadith when the Prophet is around 60 years old. And he's saying, I could see the traces on that chest. Now if Allah had willed, it could have been a clean cut. Allah doesn't need to leave a line. You understand what I'm saying here? Allah doesn't need to leave a scar. Because Allah heals and complete, but Allah wants to demonstrate that something physical happened. And there is a physical line, like you have in a scar, that Anas ibn Malik saw, that I saw, I could see that line in the chest of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the end of the hadith in Sahih Muslim. This incident was what concerned Halima. And she decided before anything else happens, let me quietly return the Prophet sallallahu to Amina, because she doesn't know what's happening. Strange things now. She knows there's something about this child. Now this incident happens and she gets worried. And so she quietly returns the Prophet to Amina. And that was when he was returned to the care of his mother Amina. Of course, the, the, the spiritual benefits that we derive from this particular incident is that the Prophet is being prepared for a pure and clean life. The Prophet is being prepared to live the most respectable, the most dignified, the most pure life that man has ever known. So shortly after the Prophet was returned to Amina, we only have one incident that is recorded during this time. Amina decided to take her son to Yathrib. The Prophet's great grandmother was from Yathrib. Surely you see, Allah has a divine wisdom plan. That there should have been a connection, and there was a connection, between the Prophet and Yathrib before the immigration. Out of all the cities, the only city he traveled to as a little child, and the only city that he has other relatives in, 
in the entire surrounding areas is but one small village of Yathrib which was to be called Medina. Coincidence? Of course not. Allah has a plan. Allah has a plan. And so, and it was of course the custom of the Arabs that they preserved their lineage completely. And they were proud of their lineage as you know. And they knew exactly who was who for not just 10 generations, all the way back to, they say Ibrahim or Adnan, they would preserve their generations. They would know who is who. And they would keep the ties of kinship. And so, Amina decided to take this little boy to Yathrib. And she had with her the one servant that it is said that Abdul Muttalib gifted them when they got married. And this is Ummi Ayman. Abdul Muttalib gifted his son uh, when they got married, Ummi Ayman. So a lot of these stories, they come from Ummi Ayman because she's the only witness, right? So Ummi Ayman is the one telling us this story of, of what happened. So Amina traveled to uh, Yathrib, which is now called Medina, along with Ummi Ayman. And the little boy, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she was around six years old at the time. And as you all know, uh, she, they stayed there probably a few months. Again, we don't have dates, but when you travel that distance, you don't just stay two, three days. You stay two, three months. You get to know the, the, the tribe and the family. And some books of Sirah do mention that the Prophet ﷺ recognized some of the buildings of Medina when he, when he re returned uh, 50 years later. That he recognized some of the places that he was as a child in the city of Yathrib. And the Prophet ﷺ stayed there for a few months on the way back in a small little settlement, which is still uh, present to this day, and it is called Al-Abwa. Al-Abwa. Uh, Amina herself fell ill, and she passed away right then and there. And Umm Ayman had her buried by the people of the village, Abwa. And so, to this day, her grave is at a place called Abwa. And it is reported in Sahih Muslim, that on one journey when the Prophet was returning home with the Sahaba, and the path to Mecca, sorry, the path to Medina is straight ahead. He simply diverted away from the path. He turned away from the path and started walking basically into the wilderness, away from the road. They did have roads, not like our roads, but they had landmarks. They know this is the road. He turns away from the road and he walks away. All the Sahaba silently just walk with him, not even asking a question. Whatever the Prophet does, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا They're just walking with him. And the Sahaba who are narrating this, they say, that the Prophet ﷺ found a grave over there and he sat down and he cried like we had never seen him cry before. Until his lihya, his beard, which is, mashallah, it is narrated, the Prophet had a very big beard. His beard was wet with tears. And many of the Sahaba had never seen him cry before. And this was the, t the time when they saw it so much so that his beard وسلم, became wet. And subhanAllah, the Sahaba did not ask one question they didn't open their mouths, but when they saw the Prophet ﷺ crying, the whole congregation is crying with him. This is the love that they have. They don't even know what's happening, but they're just crying with him. And they're waiting for him to explain what is happening. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ obviously is crying in this manner, I mean, we don't need to mention this is his mother. He must have memories, not maybe that many. He was six years old when she passed away. So the Prophet's father passes away when his mother is pregnant with him. And his mother barely has two and a half years really to take care of him and nourish him because he was being taken care of by Halima as well. And then when the Prophet is barely six years old, he loses his mother and his father. So he is then entrusted to Abdul Muttalib. It is said that Abdul Muttalib uh, would have a raised platform in front of and connected to the Kaaba because he's the chieftain of the Quraysh. And around Asr time when the shade would come, this platform was in that shade of the Kaaba. And he would sit there and discuss the affairs of the Quraysh and the Quraysh would come and he's the chieftain. So this is where this is the public uh, platform. This is where he would sit every single afternoon. And of course, this is the platform that is the equivalent of the king's throne. Nobody sits on it. None of his sons, none of his grandsons. This is for Abdul Muttalib. And the one thing that we have recorded that once the Prophet Sallallahu as a young boy came running and he jumped onto the platform to be next to Abdul Muttalib. His uncles, as Zubair and others, pulled him back down because this is, you're not supposed to go there. And Abdul Muttalib stopped them. He said, leave him. This is my child and he can remain on this platform. So out of all of the grandchildren, the only one that he allowed to be on that platform was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As we all know, at the age of eight, once again, for the third time, our Prophet became an orphan. First his father, then his mother, and now his grandfather. 
One after the other, he became an orphan. And one of the things that Abdul Muttalib did on his deathbed is that he entrusted the Prophet ﷺ to his son Abu Talib. And the reason, of course, as we mentioned before, the only full brother that was still alive of Abdullah was Abu Talib. Abu Abdul Muttalib had married five wives, one after the other. Uh, he had married five wives, and from one of them, he had uh, a number of daughters and two sons that were still alive at this time, and that is, uh, of course, Abdullah had passed away, and then Abu Talib. So the full brother of Abdullah was Abu Talib, unlike uh, Abu Lahab, unlike Hamza, all of these were not full brothers, they were half uncles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Abu Talib takes charge of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I think the story of Muhammad is actually one of my favorite stories that we've come across of actually, or actually reacted to. There's just, I don't know, there's just something about him that's very lovable and likable and just, you're just drawn to his story. A big shout out to the person that ever told us to react to this, it's my favorite. I mean the other stories like the story of Moses, this one has to be my favorite, like they just, you feel like, you feel feel and think like you actually know someone just from this information that we get from here this i'm glad i did the second part this is just my favorite story i don't know about you guys let me know what you feel my, about this video and how you feel about my reaction don't forget to give this video a thumbs up share it with your friends and of course do not forget to subscribe